A narrative is in so many ways like music. Just as when we play the piano, we select keys, or on the guitar, we select strings. We don't play all the notes at once. We don't just run our fingers along all of the keys, or all of the strings, from end to end, and back again, continually, back and forth. That would sound disorganised, and like chaos. Instead, we pick out with our fingers the strings, or strike the piano keys. We select notes and chords and place them in an order, a pattern that we enjoy to hear. But at the same time as you pick out, you reject what you do not pick out. Not all the notes are included. But all the notes still exist. They are still there, still part of the whole, even if not included in this particular symphony. The same is true of the narrative we tell ourselves about everything. Consider this glass. Does it break because it is dropped or because it is faulty? The answer may seem obvious given everything that we have learnt about what happens to glass when it is dropped. But in thinking that this is the only possible answer, we reject the possibility of the glass being sold by the manufacturing company with a warranty proclaiming that the glass is unbreakable and live demonstrations under lab conditions proving the glass to be unbreakable or your money back. In such a scenario, did the glass break because it was dropped or because it was faulty? And should I get my money back? Within this story, more things need to be considered. For example, is the guarantee limited by the height it was dropped from, or the surface it was dropped onto? Does it depend on the way it was being used at the time? You can see how complex a simple question can become. The manufacturer will argue the story that best supports their claim, and the buyer will have another story. This demonstrates how our lives are multi-storied. There are many stories occurring simultaneously and different stories can be told about the same event. In this case, the breaking of the glass has at least two stories, but more if you include every member of staff involved in the production of the glass, and even more still if you include the people present when the glass was dropped. No single story can be free of ambiguity or contradiction. No single story can condense or encapsulate all the complicities of life. There is always an alternative narrative. In terms of migration, the inherited narrative is a thin story. Every one of our truths has been formed by a complex combination of information, influences, education, religion, cultural background, direct experience, social norms, family expectations, attachments, trauma, etc. We are raised in a world surrounded by others confident that their truth is the most accurate truth and we should adopt that truth as our own. Those people who we most identify with or who hold positions of authority, we believe their truths without question, and these become our foundational beliefs. When we are then confronted with someone with opposing foundational beliefs, for many of us, it can be scary. A thin story is a story that usually contains a very wide range of definitive conclusions about a person's life and identity. As such, these stories contain very little of the whole story and tend to be negative and sensationalised. These stories do not allow room for the richer, brighter stories and the many, many possibilities. Those stories are often so hidden. The multi-stories of life that can often contradict the current dominant storyline are pushed to the fringes.
An important missing part of the narrative is we were invited. The Windrush scandal affected all the Commonwealth nations and has provided a partial history lesson, but an incomplete one. Migrants were recruited from the Commonwealth countries by the British government to fill post-World War II labour shortages. The first group travelled aboard the HMT Empire Windrush in 1948, given the migration its name. But let's explore migration in more detail. In an article published on January 3rd, 2019, in The Conversation, entitled What Britons Get Wrong About Migration, written by Bobby Duffy, Professor of Public Policy and Director of the Policy Institute, King's College, London. Duffy outlined the misconceptions about migration. But first, let's remind ourselves of some of the most common myths. Returning to the article by Bobby Duffy, first he points out, we get a lot wrong. Surveys show Britons think around a quarter of the population are immigrants, when it's half that, at around 13%. And they think immigration from EU countries is nearly three times the actual level of 6%. The Ipsos latest Perils of Perception study shows which key facts the online public across 37 countries get right about their society and which they get wrong. Now in its fifth year, the survey aims to highlight how we're wired to think in certain ways and how our environment influences our perceptions. According to Ipsos, the majority of countries hugely overestimate levels of migration, a pattern seen in previous studies. The average guess across 37 countries is that 28 are immigrants when the actual figure is less than half that at 12%. Nearly every country included in the study also overestimates their Muslim population by a large margin. The average guess was more than double the actual figure. 20% was the guess versus 8% as actual. Bobby Duffy continues, it's not just the scale, but the composition that people get wrong. 
When surveyors ask people what type of immigrant come to mind when they think of immigration, refugee and asylum seekers are the most mentioned, when they're actually the smallest category of immigrants. People's mental image is driven by media coverage and the tendency is to focus on the most desperate cases, not the more common categories of people who immigrate to work, study or be with family. According to Ipsos, Overall perceptions of immigration are problematic because they cover such a wide range of people and circumstances and our top of mind or imagined migration is very different from the real breakdown of immigrant groups. Most importantly, people in the UK are most wrong on the impact of immigration. Large proportions think that immigration increases crime levels reduces the quality of the NHS and increases unemployment amongst skilled workers when the best evidence available shows none of these are true.
Duffy goes on to argue that given British people's mistaken belief in the link between immigration and crime, it's no surprise they think immigrants make up more of the prison population than they actually do. Those thousand people surveyed guessed 34% of prisoners were immigrants, when the reality is 12%, in line with their share of the population. Firstly, we know that there is a complex relationship of cause and effect in our misperceptions. We overestimate what we worry about as much as the other way round. So our overestimates of immigration levels are as much a signal of our concern as a carefully calibrated estimate of reality. Our view of reality is coloured by our emotions and this means that simple myth-busting alone will have limited impact. Second, many argue that the underlying driver of concern around immigration is not a cost-benefit calculation but a broader cultural concern that British society is changing too fast. So correcting the misreading of these facts by showing that immigration is actually good for our economy, public finances and services may miss the point. So let's return for a moment to the glass and consider a story that has not been considered yet. One viewpoint that we have not yet discussed. The viewpoint of the glass. The glass is an object. It does not know it is a glass. It is just a glass. The same is true of a human being. A human being at the end of the day is just that. A human being having an experience much the same as you. There are more things that connect us than that divide us. It's hard to see under the endless classifications, categories, brands or labels that we apply to ourselves. These next five stories are from Luton residents. My neighbours, my friends, the people I share this space and place that we all call home. But first, let me tell you how Luton fits into the national narrative in terms of labour. In the 16th century, Luton officially opened its doors to brickmaking when small clay pits were opened. In the 17th century, Luton became a prominent town in Bedfordshire for making straw hats. Vauxhall Motors came to Luton in around 1905 and is one of the two industries in Bedfordshire that contributed to the national economy. Opened in 1938, Luton Airport joined a thriving industrial town with success from hat making, automotive, engineering works and brick making. It is primarily these industries within which migrants from across the Commonwealth came to work. Growing up Caribbean, many of my elders living in Luton worked for British Rail, Electrolux, the Luton and Dunstable Hospital and Vauxhalls but we'll turn to this in a moment. First, some of my neighbours have agreed to let me share their stories with you as long as their identity is concealed. With the following stories, I hope to share with you the truth about migration. So my dad came here in the 1970s. His dad, my granddad, came here when they were asked to leave Kenya in the 1970s. My granddad chose to come here and he sent his family to India until he had found a place to settle down and to live. The place he chose to live was Luton. This is when my dad came. I think it was probably hard for him because he was a teenager. Entering the school system when you're a teenager having been living in a completely different country where you don't really speak English. It must have been quite hard for him. I've lived here for all of my life, obviously. My parents married in 1980 and my mum came over to England. I was born in 1981 and I think the 80s were a very different space to be in from what they are like now. 
Although I think Luton has always been diverse, during the 80s I was often told to go home. My parents told me not to pay attention, that people don't really know what they're talking about because they didn't really know the history of Great Britain and the United Kingdom and the part they played in global events. It's why there was so much movement, you know. We were invited here. People were encouraged to come here. Being in a place like Luton made it easier to fit in. Just because it is so diverse and there's lots of different kinds of people from all over the world. Having such a migrant community, I think it helps people to accept diversity. What do I think about cultural diversity in Luton? I think it's thriving. I think Luton wouldn't be the place it is without it. I think its impact is underestimated. Look at how successful Luton is in integrating people. On the whole, most people live together in relative harmony. You hear about Luton on the news. It's always sensationalised. Luton is home to me. I was born here. I have chosen to stay here. I have left and I have come back. It annoys me when people mock and abuse it. Luton has got a very strong cultural heritage and the diversity of Luton can only be a positive thing. When I first came to Luton, one thing that was important to me was to learn English. I am Sri Lankan, born in Germany, so my first two languages are Tamil and German. English is my third language. I came to England in 2004 and started high school. I had difficulty being accepted in schools at first because I lacked understanding in English. I could only say pardon, but I did know the basics of English. I just did not have the confidence to speak up easily. I was eventually accepted at a high school Although English was never my favourite subject, yet this is the language that I sat my GCSEs and A-levels in at high school. I did well in my GCSEs and A-levels, but I only obtained a D grade for GCSE English and I wanted to retake my English exam, but I would have to pay for it. I then went into technical college where I studied German and the German teacher was able to help me to speak English with a strong attitude and develop a strong vocabulary. This gave me the confidence to study German, French, health and social care and counselling. However, in order to apply for work or further studies, I needed a GCSE C grade in English. At this same time, I got engaged and married. There was much family pressure and much of the family did not understand why I wanted to work and study as my husband had a good job, he could look after us and we could start a family. However, I knew the life that I wanted to create for myself and to start a new life. My husband and I decided to move to Luton and buy a house. House prices are 250,000 for a similar house that cost 400,000 in other areas. It's much quieter here. We had come from urban areas, so we found Luton to be relaxing and it is friendly and it felt like the right place to start our new life. I retook my English GCSE and passed with a C grade. I studied nursery teaching and now I am a teaching assistant. When I first arrived in Luton, I arrived by train. I had to walk into town and that was when I saw this big sign, this big picture and it said, if you can dream it, you must do it. This picture gave me strength, it motivated me, it inspired me, 
These words are in my heart. I do not believe they will ever be removed. I was working on a farm in my country, Italy. But ever since I was 13 or 14, I have wanted to travel. I travel to many, many cities in Italy. I travel to Monaco and Germany. I loved experiencing the many different cultures, languages, traditions, all the different ways of life. Work on the farm is seasonal, so for six months the pay may be good and then maybe no pay for six months. I started training in an Italian school that specialised in one of the hospitalities and which works with a corporation in Luton. After I finished training, I had my interview and then I became employed here. Seeing that sign when I first arrived gave me power and energy. It was the word must. If you can dream it, then you must. Not should or maybe, but you must. And I knew that it was good for me to follow my dream. I came to Luton from Nigeria in the early noughties. I was studying a degree at the University of Bedfordshire. Nine Red did a presentation at a student union event and a few other students I knew were volunteering with them doing counselling. They had advertised for some volunteers to help with events, exhibitions and carnivals. I wanted to engage in the community, so in my spare time, when I was available, I volunteered with Nine Red. When I graduated from university, I stayed in Luton and helped out with local projects. One of Nine Red's directors volunteered as a counsellor for a traffic accident victim charity, and I became very interested in their work. We have problems with traffic accidents where I live in Nigeria and I decided that I wanted to return and start a charity similar to this traffic accident charity in Bedfordshire. During my time in Luton, I met with so many different types of people from all over the world and from so many backgrounds. I have learnt so much from so many people. I had experiences that I will never forget and I enjoy teaching people about my culture and the history of my country. I didn't plan to come to Luton. I just landed here. I came to join my brother. I was born in Romania, but I lived and worked in Italy for many, many years before coming to England. I was in my late teens when I left Romania. I worked in Italy, then I came here in 2018. I have worked in many warehouses and industrial workplaces since I arrived in short contracts and agency. I also study for a degree in psychology at the University of Bedfordshire. I'm in my final year. I work and I study. I talk with my neighbours and I play with their pets. I visit with my niece and with my brother. After I have finished studying, who knows? Maybe I will want to travel again. Maybe I will make my home in Luton. My daughter lives here now, but she is grown. She does not need me to be here to look after her. I think it is good to travel. I think it is good to broaden your vision and to see different places, people and things. This I know is a very small sample. I wanted you to meet some of the people from my neighbourhood. I wanted to share some of my Luton with you. And in that vein, let me share with you some of my story. I grew up in an environment 
that was always filled with stories from home. The bright smiles and laughs that I would always hear coming from the living room when they reminisced on days gone by and stories of their first arriving. Stories are always fascinating, but even more so when there is a little mystery, a little thing that sticks in your mind because it takes a moment to fully comprehend. These stories teach so much more than just cultural traditions, customs and values. They also provide valuable lessons in perception and in meaning. Allow me to explain. All countries have seasons, but not all seasons look the same. Growing up in Britain and of Caribbean descent, I learnt as a child that trees and plants primarily stay green in the winter in the Caribbean and that in the UK trees primarily die down in the winter and are reborn in the spring. Imagine then in the days before the internet what winter must look like in the UK to someone arriving who has never seen winter before. Imagine how in awe you would be of the reds, the golds and the majestic colours of autumn leaves if you've never before seen an autumn and what this experience would mean to you. I grew up hearing tales of my elders, first arriving in Luton and seeing rows and rows of dead trees planted in gardens and along roadsides and wondering why English people keep dead trees. Having left a country with lush green leaves and foliage, what other thought could there really be when you've never before experienced winter? This is one of the things that I love the most about Luton. It's not just that you can learn other people's traditions, other people's customs, values and ways of life. It's not so much that it is so rich with diversity and so rich with so much of what life is about but more than that it is rich with these alternative perceptions these alternative mindsets these alternative ways of being ways of thinking and ways of doing this is what makes me love Luton so much and what inspires me to go out and speak to and meet so many many different people from so many many different places So how then did Luton become my home? The elders in my life worked in various industries, British Rail, London Transport, Vauxhalls and Electrolux, and they were amongst the nurses that were recruited by the NHS to work in the Luton and Dunstable Hospital. My parents came to Luton after a bereavement. My dad at the time worked for British Rail and he wanted to move to another part of the country. After work one day, he got on the train and decided to stay on it until it terminated. The train terminated in Luton and my family have been an active part of the community ever since. Thank you for coming on this journey with me, taking the time to travel through Luton, migration and me and the friends and family and neighbours that I've met along the way. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation as much as I've enjoyed presenting to you. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night.